damn late. Oh. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing they army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing Gareth Porter the Great. He is the author of Perils of Dominance about Vietnam, and he's the author of Manufactured Crisis about Iran's civilian safeguarded nuclear program, and uh, of course about 10,000 articles about everything important in the world, all of the terror wars, and all of this stuff, uh, Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, and Syria. And uh, writes to the American Conservative at uh, Truthout. We've republished everything at antiwar.com one way or the other. Uh, this one is at Truth Dig. Could Trump take down the American empire? I don't know, Gareth. Welcome back to the show. How you doing? I'm fine. Thanks, Scott. Glad to be back. Uh, very happy to have you here. All right, so there's some things we all know about uh, things Trump has at least said about his uh, foreign policy beliefs. Uh, his policies are another matter, but there's new insight that you have gained here, uh, obviously, from reading the Woodward book. As does happen, it's funny enough, uh, I learned some things in there. Uh, notably, the most important thing, I thought, was the part about General Kellogg really wanted to get out of Afghanistan and was on the side of uh, Bannon and Trump there on that before Trump Indeed. fired Bannon and <laughs> went along with the rest of them. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that was the most important note there. Um, but you learned a lot. And so what you're asking here is if uh, Trump is anti-imperialist enough to actually do something about it. He does have a particular right-wing populist point of view that doesn't believe in policing the world, does believe in kicking a lot of ass, but doesn't believe in taking responsibility for all of the rest of humanity forever in that kind of a way. We saw this. I'm just rambling here, but you know what? It's important. We saw this in 2013 when Obama said, we're going to go save the people from the evil dictator that's using gas on them. And the American right said, we don't care about enough about the Syrians to go and bomb them and protect them like it's being sold us. Screw them. And so we, the anti-war people, were like, OK, well, well that's good enough for us, I guess. And uh, so that that attack was avoided at the time. Um, that's the best we can get out of the right. That's sort of Donald Trump's point of view, although he has attacked Assad twice over fake gas attacks. But you can see where he comes from that sort of populist, uh, reluctant right point of view. But um, but what difference does it make when uh, he always ends up siding with the go ahead and be pretend macho and kick ass side of every argument? Well, of course, he doesn't always end up on that side of the argument. That's really the point of this article and, and the point that uh, I think Woodward's uh, book Fear really documents quite uh, uh, quite convincingly. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not a matter so much, in my view, at least, of Trump being, quote, anti-imperialist. That term um, almost uh, inevitably invokes a kind of um, perspective that is associated with the left. Um, and certainly that is not Trump's perspective. He is, um, I would I would say he's coming at it from uh, a mercantilist or neo-mercantilist point of view, which, uh, you know, does mean that he is not interested in uh, protecting the rest of the world. That's true. Uh, but going beyond that, he's more interested or more concerned with uh, protecting the flow of money out of the United States to other countries 
um, uh, than he is in, I mean, he's, he's interested in uh, not having that outflow to other countries and if possible, having the inflow to replace the outflow. So, I mean, that, that to me is the, uh, the real sort of ideological underpinnings of his opposition to the wars and uh, troops, uh, stationing of troops that he has um, uh, clearly uh, opposed within the administration, which have caused so much uh, uh, worry on the part of the uh, people who are responsible for the for the empire. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, so the thing of it is this. I mean, I don't know if he even understands it the way you and I would about, you know, all these international institutions basically as a fig leaf for American power and the way all this stuff supposedly works. I mean, if you look at his criticisms of NATO, he said, you know what? They're obsolete. They ought to focus on fighting terrorism more. In other words, come with us to Iran or whatever kind of crap. But he never said, I want to withdraw from NATO. He never said the thing is useless. He always just said, you guys ought to spend more on weapons. And by the way, we have some for sale and this kind of deal. So it always just seemed to me like it's really hardball. He, I've never heard him actually question the permanence of the NATO alliance in any significant way at all. Have you? Well, no, I haven't. I think you're absolutely right. And that, uh, from my point of view, that is precisely what I was trying to get at uh, in, in saying that he's not uh, anti-imperialist, but rather neo-mercantilist. And therefore, you're right, he, he's not so much concerned with the existence of NATO as he is with the money flows that are associated with it. And with, again, uh, making sure that the United States is not committed through NATO to uh, any engagements that uh, really are not unnecessary. So uh, there, there's a big difference between his point of view and anti-imperialism, but at the same time, uh, it's very possible that he could achieve some of the results that anti-imperialists really would like to see. Yeah. All right. Now, so the thing he's been best on so far is Korea, right? Over George W. Bush and Barack Obama's dead body, Trump has said, hey, South Korean doves, go ahead, take the lead, get this done. Let's make sure to thank me for it. And so, and it's been great so far. There's all this progress. I can hardly keep track of all the great little sub agreements that the North and South uh, Korean governments have made with each other, uh, including some real significant ones very recently about demilitarizing the DMZ, for God's sake, if you could ever imagine that. Um, and so talk about that part of the Woodward book, too, about how this really and uh, this really struck me about the Woodward book was that and, and I think all of us can imagine Trump being very mad and yelling and screaming at people and being considered by his subordinates as a little bit unhinged or something like that. But all the times in the book that they call him unhinged, all the times that they consider what he's doing to be crazy, insane, out of control, blah, 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 all those kind of characterizations. It's always when he's calmly announcing he really wants to get the troops out of Korea. And they just simply disagree about the policy. It's never like, you know, the the scenes of Bill Clinton throwing his purple fits where he stomps his feet and, you know, gets all angry or whatever. It's not like that. It's a, It was like, and then Trump said, I want to get the troops out of Korea. And we all agreed he's a madman. You know, I think, I think that's true that that he's very I mean, all the indications are from the Woodward book and from all the other sources that have been published. And it's not just Woodward, but other press accounts that make the same uh, point or, or show the same reality, which is that Trump has repeatedly uh, expressed, uh, uh, you know, I would say uh, puzzlement, uh, dis being disturbed and, and even irritated, if not angry, with his aides over the fact that we still have all these uh, commitments left over from you know, past decades, many decades in the past, in some cases, and in other cases, very new um, commitments that were made in the previous administration or two, um, and that he, he has been calm, but very determined and that, that that is what is really upsetting them. It's not his demeanor. It's the substance of his position. And, and you're right. South Korea uh, is the one issue which I think he has been creating the greatest waves, the greatest disturbances within the permanent war complex, if you will, than uh, more than any other. And, and I think here, this is a, the perfect illustration of his 
his neo-mercantilism, if you will, uh, at work because he makes it clear from the beginning uh, in the accounts that um, that uh, Woodward provides in his book that what disturbs him here is that the South Koreans are getting a free uh, pass. They're they're getting U.S. troops uh, uh, stationed in South Korea. Um, it's not free, but they're getting a, a huge uh, discount, a, a huge uh, uh, sort of uh, subsidy from the U.S. military for the stationing of U.S. troops. Uh, and, and specifically, uh, we learn from the book, I hadn't seen this anywhere else, although I'm sure it must have been published elsewhere, that the total cost per year of the stationing of U.S. troops in South Korea is $2 billion. So the cost is $2 billion a year, of which the United States is paying $1.2 billion uh, and the South Koreans are paying 800 million. Well, you know, to, to Trump, that's that's chump. Uh, that's that's a chump deal for the United States, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And he's saying, uh, let's pull them out. Um, now, you know, there may be there may be other elements to his thinking here besides the fact that the South Koreans are getting uh, a good deal. Um, and you know, presumably, as time goes by, he realizes more and more that. Those troops are just not needed, and and so that is you know certainly underlying his position. I would say to one degree or another, and to a greater degree as time goes by. But it it really begins with I mean the argument that he immediately comes out with is one of, about how much it's costing the United States, and they're the ones who should be paying for it. Uh, but I do think, in fact, that that Trump is moving toward. A position with the help, I must say, of uh, President Moon of South Korea, of of being able to say, um, regardless of what the South Koreans are willing to pay, the United States doesn't need to be there, and there's no point in our having troops stationed in South Korea. Yeah. All right. So, you know, maybe I should have kind of started with this, or maybe I should just forget it. But it's kind of interesting to me that there's this guy Walter Russell Mead who, uh, you know, he's like this professor of international relations type. I think he's probably pretty bad on most stuff. Um, but uh, so he he has this kind of theory of international relations where uh, he says it's the Hamiltonians, the Wilsonians, the Jeffersonians, and the Jacksonians. Well, I set them out of chronological order there. Jeffersonians and Jacksonians and uh, Hamiltonians and Wilsonians there. And so... Um, I guess Ron Paul would have been the Jeffersonian and, uh, you know, like in the uh, inaugural address and all that. But then so that makes Trump kind of the funhouse mirror, you know, horror movie version. Uh, the Jacksonians who are, you know, perfectly willing to hawk it up and whoop it up and fight. And we're going to obliterate ISIS. And we're going to bring back torture and, you know, all of this kind of thing. Uh, escalate the air war over Afghanistan, for example, troops too, but especially the air war. And so here's a guy who is saying things like, well, you know, what are we even doing in Afghanistan? The whole thing is ridiculous and stupid and we shouldn't do it. And then by the way, who even needs a strategy? Just kill people. Just isn't that your job? Go over there and kill them until they're all dead or something. What's taking so long? And so he just as soon bomb them all to death as bring them home because what's the use and it's a matter of if you ask him before or after lunch because there's no real principle involved he's just a crotchety old man well he's a crotchety old man but but it's the military that is tell, telling him that he needs to uh, remove all those restraints that obama placed on the military and he's going along with them now of course he, he deserves to be criticized for having agreed to that but let's be clear that this this move to uh, basically remove restraints on bombing and drone strikes in Afghanistan is something that the military is pushing on him. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, in fact, from, from his point of view, it'd be better if we got out of there completely. So I'm not absolving him by any means. Uh, that's far from it. But but I think we need to be clear that the primary responsibility here for not not legally, the primary responsibility for pushing that line comes from the war, uh, the, the war complex itself. Yeah. Well, and, you know, really, he really is just like Barack Obama on this, where he knows better, but then he goes along anyway. And, you know, basically it's an arm wrestling match and they win every time. Uh, well, he gives into them when he could just as easily tell them to go to hell. He's supposed to be the boss. The buck stops here and all of that thing. 
you know? Yeah. And, and in fact, you know, when they say, and this is what really bothers me about this is all this reporting about these people and the way that they weigh these decisions, they all just sound so stupid. I mean, I believe it. I, I have no real reason to. It's just a Woodward book shrug. But supposedly Mattis says... That, well, we're trying to prevent a bomb from going off in Times Square. That's why we have to do this. When everybody knows that the Times Square attack was provoked by the CIA's drone war in Pakistan. The guy was a perfectly happy, perfectly adjusted American citizen. In fact, had a wife and a house and an advanced degree and a professional career. And he went home to Pakistan to visit relatives and he saw dead people from an American drone strike and volunteered to the Pakistani Taliban, which had never attacked America. The Tariqi Taliban had no beef with us until this. And they recruited him to try to blow up Times Square. And these idiots want to say that the war is preventing that kind of thing. And that's the best example that they have. Right. And that's that is just so reprehensible. You know, we can hardly find the words for it. I, I agree. Uh, just just to put an exclamation point on that story, however, just let me put that particular quote in context in the context of the sequence of events in the Trump administration. This was what occurred in the summer of 2017. And this is really a critical uh, story in this whole a uh, series of, of episodes, because this was the occasion on which uh, Trump was complaining bitterly about the Pentagon's asking for more, um, more ability to make war in North Africa, because they were saying, uh, you know, the situation in North Africa is getting out of control. This is ISIS affiliates in North Africa that we're uh, trying to track down. And so we need more freedom of operations. We need more people. We need more uh, bombs and so on and so forth. And uh, what what Trump said was uh, he didn't see why uh, this was necessary. And he said he complained that you're trying to get me to station troops, to keep troops, to put troops in everywhere in the world. And that's where uh, Mattis came out. And, and he said, well, I don't understand why we have to do this. And that's when Mattis came out and said, well, Mr. President, we're doing this so a bomb doesn't go off in Times Square. And then, and this is a key point that I think everybody needs to understand, that, that uh, Trump's response to him was that you can make the same argument for any country in the entire face of the globe. So this is just to point out that Trump didn't buy Mattis's argument at all. And in fact, that it was that episode that caused Mattis to suggest that they take Trump uh, off to the tank in the Pentagon in the hope that maybe taking him away from the White House and subjecting them to this atmosphere would have a stronger effect of their arguments. Mm-hmm. All right, you guys, here's how to support the show. First of all, subscribe to the RSS feeds, iTunes, Stitcher, and all of that. Uh, All the feeds are available at scotthorton.org and also at libertarianinstitute.org. You can also follow me on youtube.com slash scotthortonshow. And sign up for Patreon. If you do, anybody who signs up for a dollar per interview gets two free books from Listen and Think Audio. And uh, also, you'll get keys to the new Reddit page, Reddit dot com slash scott horton show and then if you go to scott slash donate 20 bucks will get you the audiobook of fool's errand time to end the war in afghanistan 50 bucks will get you a signed copy of the paperback there and a hundred dollar donation will get you either a qr code commodity disc or a lifetime subscription to listen and think libertarian audiobooks that's all at scott slash donate and uh, also anybody donating uh, $5 or more per month there, if you already are or if you sign up now, you'll get keys to that new Reddit group as well. Already got about 50 people in there, and it's turning out pretty good. Again, that's reddit.com slash Scott Horton Show. If you're already donating or you're a new donor, just email me, scott at scotthorton.org, and I'll get you the keys there. And hey, 
do me a favor. Give me a good review on iTunes or Stitcher, or if you liked the book on Amazon.com, and the audiobook is also on iTunes, and I uh, sure would appreciate that. And listen, if you want to submit articles to the Libertarian Institute, uh, please do, and they don't have to be about foreign policy. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. Well, so a couple of things there. I mean, um, first of all, there was another thing right along these lines where when they went to Camp David and they cornered him on Afghanistan um, where and, you know, I criticized him for this. I explained at the time, you see exactly what he's what they're doing here is they're saying they're using the example of Obama's withdrawal from Iraq to say anything that happens bad in a country after you withdraw troops from it will be your fault for withdrawing troops from it. Whereas that's, anything bad that happens while troops are still there, well, geez, that's just despite their best efforts. But <laughs> um, And meanwhile, Trump himself, unbelievably, right, unbelievably and magically in the annals of all of American politics, got it so right when he said Obama created ISIS by backing the jihadists in Libya and especially by backing the jihadists in Syria for years before the rise of the Islamic State there. And then also he pulled the troops out of Iraq. So when the Islamic State rolled into Iraq, there was no one there to stop him. And Trump had said that in the campaign at least once or twice. But then he dropped the part about yeah. Libya and Syria. And he truncated under instruction from whoever the whole rant to, well, he pulled the troops out of Iraq. So once that myth was bought, then apparently, according to Woodward, that Mattis and you cite this in your article, too, that Mattis used this against him right here. That if you pull troops out of Afghanistan and ISIS goes on to fight one more day, I'm going to blame it on you and say that I told you so. Now that there's this group of basically a bunch of Pakistanis calling themselves the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, what? And, uh, yeah, good enough to count Scott, for... I'm sorry, go ahead. Scott, this is, this, is a, this is the critical point that I want to just expand on a bit. Uh, because this argument that you're citing, which is the absolutely correct, that, that this was the point that got to Trump sufficiently to get him to give in uh, at this Camp David uh, conference. And that he cited in his speech announcing the escalation, he cited exactly this argument. That's right. That's right. And it was that same argument in different circumstances uh, that was used by the military and its allies against Obama when Obama was opposing the escalation of, of U.S. troop uh, engagement in Afghanistan in 2009. It was the same argument that was used uh, with LBJ to get him to give in uh, and let the military have its way in Vietnam. Uh, and I talk about this in my book uh, on Vietnam, about how LBJ was still holding out uh, in, in early 2005 when McNamara and Bundy wrote a letter to him which intimated that they could no longer support his policy because he was de facto allowing the communists to win and that once when it when it happened if and when the communists took power they would not be able to defend him in other words they would go to congress and the media and blame lbj so this is the same tactic that has been used over and over again in the annals of us wars by the military and their national security elite uh, friends to uh, force a president against his will to go along with with their plans for either going into war or escalating the war. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, another part of, you know, these guys being right wingers and not Ron Paulian types at all is that the best you can ever get out of them is let's pull out of one war so we can escalate in another. So, <laughs> for example, Stephen Bannon was relatively <clears throat> good on Afghanistan, wanted to get out of there one way or the other, was never mind the whole Blackwater garbage for a moment, just for time's sake here, or to stay on point. But he, he certainly wanted to end the war there one way or the other. Um, but uh, was worse, and I think was less worse on Syria as well, right? But then was worse on Iran. And then he had Mattis, who is, you know, the mad dog Mattis who hates Iran so much, was also less 
uh, was less worse on Iran, but was worse on Syria. Have to stay and double down with the Kurds there to prevent Iranian influence there. And just like when Obama was dealing with Iran on the nuclear deal, but then backing Saudi against them in Syria and in Yemen, uh, we have this ridiculous schizophrenic policy where none of these guys have a consistent position on Iranian influence there, other than they're really upset about it. But what to do about it is always, you know, they're always kind of at odds against each other on it and they don't even really seem to have defined these questions very carefully in the first place actually that and, and just to put a fine point on bannon's uh position you know he was quoted uh, as i recall in the uh in the uh, book um as as saying we should uh get out uh or we should we should get out of south korea uh not south korea excuse me we should get out of of uh, syria um, so that we can be prepared, uh, Afghanistan, or, uh, Afghanistan primarily, so that we can be prepared for war with China. Right. I mean, he was, he was pointed China as the main enemy. So I think the point here is that all of these characters who want to be credible, or I, I don't know exactly what their game is, always have to have a primary enemy uh, or, or a primary conflict that they can say we're really in it all the way. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, that's my worst nightmare, right, is that somebody finally listens to me and they get out of the Middle East and it only leads directly to war with the Russians, and the Chinese over some stupid atoll or some some troop movement right on NATO's doorstep, i.e. within Russian borders or something. Yeah, of course. I mean, that is that's the great the great nightmare that we all we all have. And, and at this point, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced that that basically the armed services and the civilian Pentagon have no interest in a war with either Russia or China, but they have obviously the interest in justifying uh, not only the weapon systems, but the military uh, strategy that uh, takes them right up to the edge of of China, uh, the, the borders of China and Russia. And that is where the danger lies. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as, as Mort Halperin once wrote, prophetically, I think, if you give the military a weapons system, they will ultimately want to use it. Yeah. They will ultimately find a situation where they have to make an argument that the weapon system is needed and that, you know, in other words, there's a whole train of uh, consequences to giving them the military wherewithal to fight a war. And I think both this present situation in regard to China policy and the situation in regard to Russia policy are, are primary examples of this. And that is what I am going to focus on more and more in the coming months and years. Good. Uh, listen, here's another thing I'd forgotten about, Gareth, um, on the previous point, but uh, it's here in my notes. Page 196. Bannon makes a deal with Mattis. If you support containing China more, I guess, then I'll shut up about Afghanistan. Because after all, the reason we're in Afghanistan is to block the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, as if they're rolling through Afghanistan any decades soon. Um but that, since that's the pretext is about China anyway, you know, bad news yeah, for you, posh tunes. You thought this was about you, but yeah. Look, the Chinese are already are already engaged in Afghanistan. They're they're uh, they're buying the rights to minerals there. I mean, that's the, what they do. They buy the rights to to uh, raw materials to minerals. They don't put troops in. That's all. That's the difference. And, uh, you know, that that should not be a, a matter of any concern for the United States. That's even even mercantilists don't care about Chinese getting access to raw materials. That is none of their business. They don't care. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I mean, that's the thing about politicians, though, is the economics of politics are all that matter to them. So we saw this with Petraeus invoking all the mineral wealth down in the Helmand <laughs> province as yeah, yeah. The reason that we have to win this war and stay somehow, there's a trillion dollars worth of mineral wealth in under land that we could never develop with $50 billion <laughs> and with $100 billion in 50 <laughs> years. Could never develop those resources in the home and province because those guys will shoot you it, and you'd have to build railroads and highways and 
et cetera, et cetera, all of this. Not there. You just can't. It was obviously a sham, but what does he know about it, right? Only enough to use it as a talking point in the New York Times, that's all. Yeah, to try to, And then to try to – they came up with that back in 2010, then they tried to tempt uh, Trump with that as well. That's right, of course. That's correct. And, 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 you know, the thing is that they could, if they won, they could uh, tell the Taliban, we'll help you develop your mineral resources. Let's just get a peace agreement here. We'll help you with the mineral resources, and you can be rich. And take credit for it, and have all the legitimacy in the world for an Islamist uh, or Islamic government. Yeah, it would work. I'm quite sure. And by the way, about that tank meeting, back to that point. Um, I think I remember the AP version of that when it happened was that it worked real well, and that he said, "Okay, you guys convinced me." Apparently, there's a discrepancy about that. But well, no, that's not what happened in the tank. What happened in the tank was that uh, after they tried to ply Trump with this idea of, of how wonderful the liberal international order was that had been built over the decades by uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, and, and Trump, Trump, excuse me, <laughs> Trump said, uh, well, he didn't say anything. He just shook his head knowingly. That obviously, uh, he didn't buy that for a moment. And then Trump changed the subject to South Korea and brought up the whole business of uh, you know the need for the United States to get out of South Korea and how it was costing the United States too much and the South Koreans ought to be paying for it. And it was at that point that Reince Priebus, then, then the chief of staff for, for uh, Trump, called the whole thing off, recognizing that it was a total flop. They had totally failed to turn Trump even the slightest in the direction they wanted him. Yeah, well, um, except that uh Every bit of all of the wars keep grinding on, so they didn't feel that bad. And it's not like he sailed the Navy home or anything yet. So I get it that he's failed to say, wow, you guys are really smart. I guess I agree with you. Right. That hasn't happened. But (laughs) he's gone along with them anyway on everything, I guess. But I'm glad also I, I actually quoted this whole thing, wrote it down in my notes. I'm glad you quoted it, too, in your article here where Tillerson argued to him that this is what's kept the peace for 70 years, which I guess you could say, I mean, he meant this is, you know, why we didn't have a major power war in Europe or with the Chinese or Russians or something like that. But boy, there are a hell of a lot of dead Koreans and Vietnamese and Iraqis and Afghans and Syrians and Libyans and uh, Malians and God knows who, who, Hey, Latin Americans in the Reagan years and God knows who, all Indonesians uh, who suffered under the American empire in the post cold war years, but none of those people even or make the slightest mention, even as a footnote to him, you know? Yes. Well said Scott. And I, this is, this is one of the tropes of the, uh, of the war machine that most enrages me. Um, And I, I intend to write something about it soon. I mean, this is, it's so completely beyond the pale for these people to talk about, the liberal international order that they built and which has you know, kept the peace for 70 years. We got to squash that one. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, Exxon is standard oil of New Jersey. And those were the guys who built this so-called liberal order in the first place. So makes sense that that would be his position after all. Well, from their point of view, it has been a, a marvel of peace and prosperity you're right yeah um you know a lot of people don't know this and i forget all my footnotes now but yeah after world war ii i mean the state department wasn't much they didn't have ambassadors to every country in the world and all this kind of stuff right. but standard oil did and so <laughs> the state department built their entire operation in standard oil offices for starters all over the world and that was well, standard oil people basically built the State Department. Of course, the Rockefellers financed the Council on Foreign Relations the whole time. And it was all their men who staffed all the new, uh, you know, positions and all of that kind of thing. And the whole thing so was a, their accident. project in the first place. You don't think it's an accident that Rex Tillerson was the one who quoted the wonderful phrase, the, the liberal international order, and, and talked about how it, it kept the peace for 70 years. <laughs> Yeah, well, I I think there's a correlation to that causation. That's all I think, you know. Um, all right, so uh, now, so Israel, Adelson, Iran, and Trump say things. Yeah, uh, you know that this is this is the uh, the uh, explanation that I have to provide uh, every time 
I, uh, I say anything that suggests that Trump uh, could play a useful role in bringing down at least some significant parts of the uh, permanent war state, the, the, the uh, empire, the military empire, if you will, because people always say, well, what about uh, Iran and uh, Till uh, Tillerson, uh, uh, Adelson, <laughs> and, and uh, the infudation, if you will, of the President Trump and his White House to Israel. And, and they're absolutely right, of course. Uh, I've been saying that for, for many months. Um, and that is certainly at odds with any useful role that Trump can play um, in, in terms of U.S. foreign policy. But uh, on the other hand, I don't think it's the case that, that the, even, even with bringing in uh, John Bolton as a national security advisor, which was clearly done because that's what Adelson wanted. I don't think Trump made that decision on his own. I think it was forced on him by Adelson without any question. Um, and I think that, you know, Bolton wants to have a war with Iran. He never has not wanted to have a war with Iran. But I'm not convinced that Trump is going to follow Bolton in regard to a war. Uh, I just don't think that's going to happen. I think that it doesn't require even uh, the the degree of of confusion that we uh, that we see in in Trump's mind about a lot of things, uh, it, it it doesn't require much more than that to see that uh, there there's no possibility of an attack on Iran that wouldn't result in some horrible consequences in the Middle East, including a probable war uh, in Israel itself, both. From certainly from Iran, because they have the capability to retaliate now, which they didn't have 10 or 15 years ago, um, when the neocons were trying to get the United States into a war with Iran. But, you know, Hezbollah could also rain, uh, you know, missiles and, um, and, and uh, rockets on Israeli uh, territory. They may not reach all of Israel, but they could reach some significant parts of Israel and cause havoc in, in um, populated areas. So, I mean, you know, it just it just doesn't follow that despite or, or, or because of of uh, the infudation, as I call it, of Trump and his administration to the neo to the uh, uh, Adelson uh, faction of uh, the Zionists um, that that the United States is going to get into a war with Iran. I, I don't think that that's uh, likely at all. Yeah, well, I feel the same way about it as you in terms of kind of, you know, my my sort of overall impression is they would need a new and improved pretext for war and they just don't have one. And it would have to be credible enough to satisfy somebody other than themselves, you know, um, and they just don't have it. I mean, the Iranians just aren't making nukes. Um, Netanyahu's little, uh, stunt at the UN again, you know, amounts to a ridiculous hoax. Everybody look at Daniel Larrison's yeah. little blog post on that, where the translation is literally nowhere land is where he said this thing was this secret nuclear, this and that, um, yeah, yeah. all they're doing in Iraq and their intervention in Iraq is backing the same guys as America, just as it's been since 2003. So they got no excuse to complain there. Still backing the Hazaras, our friends in Afghanistan. No problem there. And so, um, you know, they're going to have to come up with something to accuse them of that, you know, the British prime minister can haul out as an excuse before the House of Commons or something. But they, they have nothing. Yeah. And, you know, you know, even though in the past I have suggested that John Bolton would try to come up with that kind of Cheney-esque uh, excuse for an attack on Iran, which he did, you know, try to attempt in 2007. We know that that you know Cheney did propose that we take advantage of some kind of attack in Iraq that could be blamed, that would would cause multiple casualties in U.S. troops, and could be blamed on Iran, and that would be the the basis for a U.S. attack on an IRGC base inside. Uh, the the Iranian uh, uh, borders, and and I thought you know it was likely that Bolton would try to come up with something similar, but I'm quite convinced that if Bolton did try to do that, and that's still a possibility, that the uh, military, the Pentagon, and the armed services would unite behind a warning to Trump 
you're being tricked. Don't fall for it. If you do, we'll expose it. We'll expose it anyway. I think that there are ways that we now can see that, that Bolton is hemmed in uh, in his ability to try to do what uh, what Cheney failed to do in, in 2007 because the Pentagon came down hard on him. Yeah. All right. Now, one more thing here real quick. And uh, I'm sorry, I got to go because I'm late for my other interview, but I screwed up everything today. So I'm just going to roll with it. Uh, did you already know or were you impressed by the fact the way it's portrayed by Woodward here that Donald Trump's lawyer, Dowd, said to him, hey, did you do this? The Russia BS. And that Trump said no. And he said, OK, so you don't care if I turn over everything you've got over to the prosecutors here. And Trump said, go ahead. And that Dowd gave them every freaking scrap of paper from the entire campaign and everything that they could think of to give them and develop this personal relationship with Mueller's right hand man. Where listen, pal, every day you know that you have confidence that I am being totally open and honest and working with you, right? Right. Every day reaffirmed all the time. Here's everything we have. Told, instructed all the witnesses to absolutely spill your guts about everything you know, please, and et cetera like that. Because I'd never heard that before, honestly. And I've read some kind of right-wing pro-Trump stuff about this or whatever. But I had never heard the narrative that Trump really had told his lawyer, turn over every freaking thing because I don't give a damn because you got nothing. And that, you know, in other words, he was really backing up his claim of a witch hunt or whatever, or that at least he certainly believed that he had nothing to hide from them about it. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's correct. Um, that that is probably what happened. I, I believe that is what happened. And you know, I mean, I don't believe that Trump was col- you know colluding, you know, certainly consciously colluding with the Russians in any way. Uh, that's that's never, as far as I'm concerned, that's never been the issue. So I think it's I think it's credible, a credible story. Yeah. Well, and you know, I hate being the guy's lawyer and everything, but what hysteria! Uh, you know, there's so many examples of things that are supposed to amount to something that end up amounting to nothing. Yeah. And well, if you, my, just like with my, Iraq, if you take all the accusations and combine them together, it makes a great story. If you take each one of them one at a time, virtually none of them stand up or at least mean what they're said to mean. Exactly. And watch watch for my next piece at Consortium News very soon on the whole myth about uh, – the Russians using social media to swing the vote in favor of Trump uh, or to even be close <laughs> to being able to do so, as um, Shane and Mazzetti and New York Times claimed uh, on September 20th in their, artic- their very long article. Yeah, ridiculous thing. OK, yeah, can't wait for your we, we've all seen and uh, talked with Joe Laurie about his takedown of that piece, but can't wait for your follow up there at Consortium News. All right. This one is called Could Trump Take Down? The American Empire, meh, by, uh, I added the meh, at uh, Truth Dig. Thanks again, man. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. All right, y'all, thanks. Find me at libertarianinstitute.org, at scotthorton.org, antiwar.com, and reddit.com slash Show. Oh, yeah, and read my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan, at foolserand.us.